It's good to be with you again this morning. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 5. It says, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There is a considerable amount of misunderstanding concerning this passage, and not just this passage, but the power of God and how He chooses to manifest that infinite power. God has the power to do anything that He wants. He can do anything that He wants. He can erase all of history and start over if He wants to do that. But God has all uh, power. There is no limitation on it, none whatsoever. There's also a considerable amount of misunderstanding that people have from this passage concerning the Holy Spirit that is un unwarranted. And the reason I say that it's unwarranted is because uh, the Holy Spirit is mentioned just uh, briefly in verse 4. And uh, to attribute everything that he says to some ununderstandable, uh, mystical operation of the Holy Spirit is to take the passage out of context. We <clears throat> oftentimes hear people say that uh, we have made God too small or that we've put God in a box or that we've put some kind of limitation on God. Well, that's not our object, of course. We want to present God as He is presented in the Scriptures. And we must understand that that's what God wants us to know. And anything else that we might imagine about God or His power or the manifestation of that power is false. And we need to forsake it. What the Bible says about God is a revelation completely and totally of God. And we don't need anything else. And we can't trust anything else. And yet oftentimes people will attribute things to God or the Holy Spirit or even Jesus that just are not so. The misunderstanding of this passage has some responsibility for that. And the question, again, is not what can God do, but how does God choose to do what He does? And uh, so uh, let's examine that for just a little bit. Where does God manifest His power, first of all? In Romans chapter 1 and... Verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. This passage is centered in considering our subject. Where does God choose to manifest His power? In the gospel message of Jesus Christ and what He did through Jesus Christ and with Jesus Christ for us. The gospel is God's power to save us. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 21. There James says, Wherefore putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Receive with meekness the implanted word. Well, what word is he talking about? He's talking about the word of the gospel. The thing that is preached God draws us, you see, through the gospel to Him and to Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 6 and verses 44 and 45. Now, there Jesus says, No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Now, that almost sounds like predestination. That God selects us for salvation, and it's God's choosing, and He's the only one that has any voice in the matter. I think that needs, this needs to be seen in context as well as the other passage. You've got to keep things in the context in order to understand. No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. But now how does God draw us? It's a question. Verse 45 answers that question. It says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. They shall all be taught of God. That's how God draws us. Everyone that hath heard from the Father... And if learned, cometh unto me. Now in verse 44, you can't come to Jesus except God draws you. 
in verse 45, everyone that has heard from the Father and has learned comes to Jesus. So how does God draw us? He draws us through the teaching, and that teaching is the teaching of the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, well, we'll read verse 13 as well. The Apostle Paul says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, for that God chose you from the beginning unto salvation, in sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you through our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean through the... Uh, he called you through our gospel. That is the gospel that they preached, that they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak. That's how God called them to that salvation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, the Apostle Paul says there, foreseeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God, it was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. Now, let's take this verse apart, see if we can understand it. Then we'll look a little bit at the context. He says, For seeing that in the wisdom of God, whatever he says here is according to God's wisdom. God planned it this way, in other words. This is not an accident. This is the way God planned it. Well, what did he plan? That the world through its wisdom knew not God. You cannot figure out God by sitting up on a mountaintop with your legs crossed and your arms folded or, or, or uh, anything like that, humming a mantra and figure out God. That'll empty your brain, sure enough. But it won't fill it with a knowledge of the truth. What it'll do is provide maybe some relaxation. Maybe it'll limber you up a little bit. But you won't know any more about God after you're done than when you began. It was God's intention that you could not go on the mountaintop and through some kind of intuitive uh, meditation figure out who He is and what He wants. You cannot logically reason to God. There, you cannot uh, find God by just following the crowd or the masses. It has to be through the foolishness of the thing preached. That's what he says. It was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the, the preaching to say them to believe. Now, let's look at this expression, through the foolishness of the preaching. Literally, that word preaching is the thing preached, which is the gospel. And you'll notice he says it's through the foolishness of the thing preached. How is the gospel foolish? Well, if you look at verse 18, you'll see that he's speaking sarcastically, if you will, and accommodatively concerning the attitude of the attitude that people who are not believers have toward the Bible. He says there, for the word of the this is verse 18, for the word of the cross is to them to perish foolishness. But it's that foolishness that God uses to save us. There's a little bit of desperate sarcasm there, trying to get us to open up our minds, trying to get us to realize that we're on the wrong track when we try to find God without the Bible. It's only in the Bible that we find God and His purpose and the salvation that He intends for us. God planned it that way. He has got to tell us what He wants. We can't reason to it. Proverbs 16.25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah says, O Jehovah, I know that the way of man is not in himself to direct his own steps. It is not the man that walketh to direct his own steps. Man cannot know the way without God's help, without God telling him how to go. This is why Jesus refers to himself in John chapter 8 and verse 12 as the light of the world. It says there, Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Have you ever been in a very dark room or maybe out camping someplace where it's really dark, you couldn't see where you're going? Well, somebody's got a flashlight. You get behind the guy has got the flashlight and you follow him and all of a sudden you know where you're going. We're in a very dark world from a spiritual and moral standpoint. Jesus has a flashlight. He guides us, but He has to tell us where to go. We've got to get behind Him. We cannot trust our own senses in the matter of our own salvation. The saving power 
of the gospel is documented throughout the scriptures. But again, we look at Romans 1, 16 and 17, where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth it, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. Now what is the saving power of the gospel? Verse 17, For therein is revealed a righteousness of God from faith into faith. The saving power of the gospel is not that it's just found in a leather-bound book with onion skin paper for pages. It is the message, it is the information that's in the gospel that is the power of God to save us. We have to know that message to know what we must do in order to be saved. What God has done that we might be saved and what uh, is expected of us. It is in the gospel that God gives us that information. And that's where his power to save is. Now, God has promised to protect us from sin and, sin, and the temptations to sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as a man can bear. Now that's not a, a good translation of that. The King James Version, the Old King James Version, and, and most of the newer translations say, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You know, I suffer a lot of temptations, and you do too. And there are times when the temptation is so great, we think that, that our temptation is unique. But it's not. Somebody else has suffered like we have suffered. Maybe not the exact same temptation, but the same intensity in the same category. Temptation is common to everybody. Everybody's tempted. Okay? If everybody's tempted, then we all have a, an equal responsibility with reference to that temptation. So he says, But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make also the way of escape, that ye may be able to endure it. God will provide a way of escape when we are tempted. We don't have to fall to temptation. We don't have to sin. If we sin, it's because we haven't used what God has given us to protect us. Now in Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul talks about the gospel armor and the defensive part of that armor that he gives us, he talks about in verse 16. He says, With all taking up the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. The shield that we have in the gospel armor to protect us in times of temptation is our faith, what we believe. And, of course, the degree of faith is very important. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, Peter says basically the same thing, a whole lot different words, but uh, it'll give us some insight. He says of those who are saved, he says, who by the power of God are guarded through faith. Now, we're guarded by the power of God. Well, what is the power of God that, that he uses to guard us? Well, we're guarded by the power of God through faith. It is the faith that God gives us unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So faith is the protection that we have from sin. Now, you think about that for a little bit. <clears throat> my salvation depends on my belief, my conviction. Not just a belief that things are so, but belief and trust that God is going to do what He said He's going to do and can do what He says He's going to do. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, And without faith it is impossible to be well-pleasing unto Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that seek after Him. Now I want you to notice the two components of faith here. Number one, we must believe that He is. Now it's not just belief in a supreme being. It's not just belief in some concept of God that we might attach to the Bible. But it's belief in God as He describes Himself in the Bible. It's very, the word He there is a very personal pronoun, and it has to do with a person, and in this case a distinct, specific person, that is God Himself. We must believe in God and what the Bible says about Him. And most of us are willing to do that. Most of us are willing to accept what God says about Himself, at least, uh, at least on the surface. But it is also a belief that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek after Him. That is, when God makes a promise, He promises us to give us certain things if we will do what we're supposed to do, then we have all kinds of trust in Him that He's going to do that, that He's faithful to His Word. 
you look at 2 Timothy, where uh, Paul makes the same point in uh, chapter 2 and verse 11. He says, faithful is the saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we shall deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he abideth faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God keeps his word. His word, his promise to save the righteous and faithful, those who are trying their best and doing what he says in his book. And he promises to punish those who don't. Or those who stop trying. God is faithful to His promise. And we have to believe and trust that about God. Now Hebrews 11 and verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. That word conviction, it has to do with being fully persuaded. Persuaded to the point there's no room for doubt. Paul had that kind of faith and he expresses that in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, where he says, For which cause I suffer also these things, yet I am not ashamed, for I know him whom I have believed. You think about what Paul is saying there. Paul's faith is so strong that he expresses it as knowledge. And what he's saying is, there's no room for doubt. I believe it, I accept it as truth, and nothing else could be possible. A strong wording of faith, isn't it? Strong expression of faith. He says, I know him whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am persuaded. His faith is a result of persuasion. Where does faith come from? The kind of faith that will protect us. It comes from persuasion. What do we mean persuasion? It means being convicted, being convinced by the weight of the argument, by the weight of the evidence. Paul considered all that God had offered as to evidence of his faithfulness, all the Bible says, all that Paul had seen him do, and he was persuaded by that, that what he was doing was right and in accord with God's will. Where does our faith come from? Well, it comes from persuasion. Persuasion of what? Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, So belief cometh of hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, King James Version says, so faith cometh of hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Same thing. The point is that our persuasion is on the basis of what the Bible says. Now somebody might be able to persuade us of something different. They might be able to persuade us uh, of something different about God, something contrary to what the Scriptures say, or in addition to what the Scriptures say. But that's not where saving persuasion comes from. It comes from hearing the Word of God. It comes from reading our Bibles and understanding what that says. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John says, Many other signs therefore did Jesus in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing may have life in His name. There's evidence in the Scriptures that Jesus is the Son of God. And if we're impressed with that, uh, evidence, then we'll become believers like Paul was a believer. When Paul went to the different cities uh, in his missionary journeys, what did he do? He first went to the synagogues, and as he did in Thessalonica, it says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 2, and Paul, as his custom was, went in unto them for three Sabbath days and reasoned with them from the Scriptures, opening and alleging that it behooved the Christ to suffer and rise again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom said he, I proclaim unto you, is the Christ. He reasoned from the Scriptures and he persuaded them on the basis of what the Scriptures said. God's power is manifested then to protect us in the Scriptures. The Scriptures are God's power to transform us. God can change us to the extent that when He's finished with us, we're no longer our old self. We are new creatures. In Titus chapter uh, 2 verses 11 and 12 it says for the grace of God hath appeared bringing salvation to all men instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world 
And that uh, instruction is found in the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. Now, as all this occurs, changes occur in me. I begin to do what the Bible says instead of what the impulse of my appetites say to do. And, and people notice a difference. Such a difference that uh, my friends might say along with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Wherefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. He's new. He doesn't live the same way. You know, Jesus talked about being born again. What's he talking about? He's talking about talking about not some miraculous occurrence that happens in a person's life. He's talking about turning over a new leaf, living a different way. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, the apostle says, Lie not one to another, seeing you have put off the old man with his doings, and have put on the new man that is being renewed unto knowledge after the image of him that created him. We put off the old man and his doings. We don't live the same way when we start following the Bible. The Bible, the Scriptures, the Gospel is God's power to change us into what we need to be. It's often been said, and I will say it too, that the New Testament is God's instruction manual for humankind today. The problem with us as, as a species is we don't follow the instruction manual. We're, we try to make things out on our own. We try to make it on our own without any help. And that's a mistake. The gospel is God's power to preach. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this to the apostles as he's about to send them out on the limited com commission. But it applies to their later preaching as well. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 19 but when they deliver you up, be not anxious what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaketh in you. Now, I have to admit that sometimes it may seem like we don't worry a whole lot about what we say or how we say it. We're kind of clumsy in our speech. But this wasn't written to us. This was written to the apostles. When... Teachers and preachers of New Testament days, other than the apostles, were taught, taught, uh, taught on t um, how to preach and, and uh, how to go about learning to preach. They received the same information that Timothy was given by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. It says, And the things which thou hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Where did Timothy get his message? He got his message from hearing Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, But abide thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a babe thou hast known the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. The, the message that, that Timothy preached was the message of the Word, heard directly from the apostles with the things that he read in his Bible. And so Paul tells him in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. He says in the King James Version, study. The key to knowing how to preach is to study what? Study the Bible. Well, we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 5, where he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And somebody says, well, that sounds like you're asking our faith to stand in the wisdom of men. Well, what we have here is a contrast between the wisdom of men and what God's plan is, where he shows his power. What does man desire? In chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it's summarized by Paul when he says, Seeing that the Jews seek for signs and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Gentiles foolishness. Men seek signs and they seek something that will appeal to their reasoning power. What does man respect? Chapter 2 and verse 1, I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech. You know, somebody comes along as a good speaker, people just flock to him. They want to hear what he says. They are attracted to that. Well, why? Why do men seek these things? Because they want their, the gratification of the flesh. These things gratify the flesh. In context, what is meant by the power of God, the wisdom and power of God that our faith is supposed to stand in?
If you look at verse 22 of chapter 1 again, this time reading down verse 24, it says, Seeing that the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Gentiles foolishness, but unto them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The power and the wisdom of God is vested in the gospel. That is where our faith is supposed to stand. Not in some miraculous uh, working of the Holy Spirit. Not in some kind of a, a magic show that people uh, try to perform in the name of God. But it is on the gospel. Paul said in chapter 2 and verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Upon what was the church in Corinth founded? Chapter 3 and verse 11, Paul says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. What's he talking about? He's talking about the message of the cross. The message of the cross, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is God's power to save, and that is where our faith is to stand. Saying that is not putting God in a box or limiting His power. Now friends, I want to thank you for your attention. It's been good to talk to you this morning, and I know there's a lot more that could be said, and I'd like to say it to you. Come worship with us at the 8th Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona, or call us for home Bible study or uh, maybe just for a discussion of these matters. Thank you very much for listening this morning.